presentation discusses the results from the phase three Odaras trial, assessing survival after treatment with adjuvant osimertinib in patients with resected EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And Dr. Roy Herbst is the deputy director of the Yale Cancer Center and assistant dean for translational research at Yale. And uh, he is going to present the findings. Um, thank you, Dr. Grillo. So I'm very uh, happy on behalf of my co-authors to present the overall survival from Adora, which is adjuvant osimertinib in patients with resected EGFR mutated stage 1B to 3A non-small cell lung cancer. Well, lung cancer is a major burden worldwide. In fact, uh, there are almost 2 uh, million cases of lung cancer a year, uh, deaths uh, across the globe. And non-small cell lung cancer represents 80 percent of that. And in about a third of those cases, the cancer is found when it can still be resected. But look at this slide. Even when you resect lung cancer, you find it at stage one. Incidentally, the five-year survival is only 65 to 75 percent. Then if you go to the right and you see those patients who have some local invasive uh, disease, some nodes, it's only 30 to 45 percent five-year survival. So more needed to be done. And before this study, all we had was standard of care chemotherapy. By the way, we still need that platinum, but we had chemotherapy. But what more could be done? Well, the EGFR mutations are uh, quite common in lung cancer. Uh, the prevalence varies around the world. So you can see in the U.S., probably 10 to 15 percent of lung cancer patients might have this abnormality. Uh, in, uh, in Asia, it can be as high as 30 to 50 percent. One point I'd love to make is we have to screen for it. You don't find it. There are also diverse groups and underrepresented groups, as we heard about from uh, our Surgeon General and others. We've got to find these mutations. We've got to identify these patients. It's a long history. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. Happy to talk to anyone about it later. But if you look in the upper right, EGFR is an on-off switch. Those patients that have this mutation, the EGFR is turned on. It causes that cancer to grow. The drug I'm going to talk about, osimertinib, is a, is, a, is a key in the lock that turns this off, a precision therapy. We first started studying these drugs almost 20 years ago. This is now a third generation drug. Why is it different? It's more potent. It targets the most common form of resistance, so we're getting the resistance early on. It gets into the brain, and one of the things a patient will tell you and we, we know is that brain metastases are spread is a horrible consequence of lung cancer. And then, of course, it's less toxic. It's designed to, to mitigate some of the most common toxicities, rash and diarrhea. Well, this is the Adora trial. It's a double-blind, randomized trial, a phase three trial, worldwide trial. Um, it was conducted in patients who had already had their cancer resected, stage 1B uh, to uh, 3A. There were three stratifications by stage, 1B versus 2 versus 3. We had about equal number of all three. The mutation type, we took two of the most common mutation types for EGFR, called an exon 19, it's a deletion, and exon 21, which is a point mutation, and race. And given the prevalence, two-thirds of the patients were, were Asian, and we stratified for that. Patients received osimertinib plus the current standard of care, uh, or placebo plus the current standard of care. People always ask me, how could you use a placebo? because there had been no studies that had shown that when you use an EGFR inhibitor in this setting, you saw any either disease-free survival or overall survival. The treatment was for three years. We could give this drug for three years because it was better tolerated than the earlier generation of drugs. The primary endpoint of this trial was disease-free survival, failure of the tumor to progress, and today I'm going to tell you about overall survival. Well, actually, I'm quite fortunate. Uh, we were on the plenary for the virtual meeting in 2020 uh, with a curve on the left. And then you can see this is the disease-free survival. The blue is the, are the patients who got the osimertinib. Uh, the yellow are the patients who got the placebo control. And you can see a hazard ratio there of 0.17. That means an 83 percent decrease in disease-free survival. And uh, those data were updated uh, just about six months ago in the JCO. And you can see even with uh, another two years of follow-up, the hazard ratio is 0.27, meaning that there's a 73 percent decrease in disease-free survival. I don't have time to show it here, but I'll tell you that we saw the same results in the brain. It kept the disease from spreading to the brain, the liver, and the bones. However, despite the fact that we had these data, and this drug's approved in the U.S. and many countries, overall survival is considered the main gold standard for treatment efficacy. And everyone was keenly awaiting these data. There are some places that have not approved it yet. There are some physicians, many surgeons, even some of my surgeon colleagues at Yale do not recommend this because they were waiting to see, does this improve survival? Well, that's what I'm going to show you right now. Well, this uh, shows uh, the whole thing. This is the survival curve. Um, this is a lung cancer survival curve. You know, 
very difficult to treat disease. As I told you, the top curve, again, is the oxymertinib. Uh, the bottom yellow curve is the control. You can see that we have median follow-up in both groups for over five years, and you can see the hazard ratio, 0.49, that's a 51 decrease in death. There's Monica's 50%. So we got it in this one trial. We have to do it for more trials. You can see at, at five years, 85% uh, uh, patients surviving in those who got the acimertinib as an adjuvant therapy, and 73% in the control. Now, this is the primary analysis stage two and three. We also added in the stage one patients, the group that would do even better. And despite that, you can see that the results look quite good as well, the same 0.49. Um, the, uh, the, the five year 88 versus 78 percent. These curves separate early, which is always something you look at, and they stay separated during the course of the trial. All those little hash marks are patients who still uh, are, are ongoing and uh, will continue to update this trial as we go forward. Now, one of the things, this is an exploratory analysis of this secondary endpoint, but you can see across all different variables, the point estimate, the, 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 the red circle, the black circle, is to the left of one meaning generally all groups benefited by sex, by age, whether they smoked or didn't smoke, race, the stage, uh, the type of EGFR mutation, and most important, that whether or not these patients got adjuvant chemotherapy, which does improve survival a little bit and is a decision made by the patient and the physician based on their stage. So safety summary, um, no new real safety signals from previous reports. Um, this is there are some side effects for this drug, and that's why it's important that we can now show the patient that they have overall survival benefit, because patients will have some fatigue and some mild rash and some diarrhea. Occasionally, there's a significant, you know, uh, what we call interstitial lung disease, but very rare. Uh, there were no deaths, by the way, in this trial from the drug. Uh, there was one COVID-19 pneumonia in the new analysis, but it's hard to say that that's due to the drug. So to conclude, in the primary analysis uh, that was presented three years ago, Osimertinib have demonstrated a statistically significant and clinically meaningful DFS benefit versus placebo in the resected patients, along with improved CNS disease-free survival and a tolerable safety profile. That was all good, but now uh, we now have survival. And what we've now shown is this DFS benefit, disease-free survival benefit, is translated into significant overall survival uh, in the primary uh, population that's the two and three, has a ratio 0.49, and in the overall population, adding in the 1B, also 0.49, both 51 percent decrease in death. The overall survival benefit versus placebo was generally consistent across all the subgroups, including by disease stage. You'll see that tomorrow all three stages benefited, and whether or not the patients got prior adjuvant chemotherapy, I'll show those, those curves tomorrow. And I would like to end by saying that it's the first global phase three study to demonstrate statistically significant and clinically meaningful DFS and OS benefit with targeted therapy in this patient population, reinforcing osimertinib as the standard of care in this group. Now, my last slide. You know, I'm sitting next to Debbie. We were, we were fellows together at Dana Farber, and while she went into GI cancer, I went into lung cancer. No one wanted to do lung cancer back then because the, 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 the data was just so poor. Um, but this gives you some impact of what's happened. Prior to Adora, we had surgery and adjuvant therapy, and that was chemotherapy. And uh, we had some benefit. We did improve survival post resection, but it was not good enough. With Adora, from the DFS analysis three years ago, we, we now took our precision medicine, the right drug for the right patient at the right time, preventing metastases, more potent. We gave it for three years. We improved disease-free survival. And now on the right, you'll see we have overall survival. And that's important, uh, and I want to just get the message out, and thank you for all being here because the press is so important to this. We've got to let patients and physicians know we've got to find these EGFR mutations or we can't use this new therapy. We have to screen patients or we can't use this new therapy. We need to give our best treatments early, and that will prevent, prevent deaths from metastases to the CNS, liver, and bone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Herbst. And now I'm going to invite ASCO expert Dr. Nathan Pinnell, who will make a few additional comments about the significance of this research. Thank you very much. Um, it is hard for me to convey, I think, how important this finding is for the field of lung cancer and how long it's taken to get here. It's been almost 20 years that we have preferentially been testing people with advanced non-small cell lung cancer for EGFR mutations and preferentially treating them with targeted treatment with EGFR inhibitors, which have had innumerable phase three trials showing they are more effective, less toxic, and people live longer and better with targeted treatment and not chemotherapy. In 2020, the standard of care for everyone with early stage curable EGFR mutant lung cancer 
a setting where arguably it's even more important to give the most effective treatments, we were still using chemotherapy as our preferential treatment, even though it wouldn't have been ethical to do a trial in an advanced patient using chemotherapy as a comparator. In 2020, that changed. We had, as you saw, the very impressive improvement in disease-free survival with the ADORA trial using adjuvant osimertinib. That led to an approval of osimertinib, and we started entering the personalized therapy era for early-stage patients. But it is important to illustrate that uh, not everyone adopted the use of osimertinib based upon the disease-free survival improvement alone. There actually have been other trials using older EGFR inhibitors that also showed improvements in disease-free survival that did not translate into improvements in overall survival. Now, with the unequivocal, highly clinically significant improvement in overall survival at five years, with three years of osimertinib across stage one, two, and three A, we've now firmly put to rest the question about whether we should be using our most effective treatment in these people based upon biomarkers, and we should firmly close the door on one-size-fits-all treatment for people with non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you for those comments. I think um, those differences that Dr. Herb showed across the globe in rates of the EGFR mutations in non-small cell are interesting. We'll probably talk about them at our breakthrough meeting in Yokohama. Um, and, uh, you know, one of our key goals, of course, is how are we going to get the EGFR testing and the drug to low and middle income countries? Um, so that is something that we're going to have to work on as well, because at the present time, it's only going to be accessible in the highest income countries. 